Everybody, it's Tyler here at the Texas State Championship, checking out team number 624, Kryptonite, a team they already got one win under their belt here. Looking for another one. They've done a fantastic job so far. To help me speak more about this team here today, I have Peyton, Shlope, Kartik, and Michael. And this robot here, an absolutely fantastic machine, a really great compact base to it. But I want you to pay attention as we go through some of the different sensors that they're using on this. Uh, they got a color sensor, the climber's fantastic. We're going to be talking about this robot. Coming up here, you got to check it out on Behind the Bumpers. Your destination for first content, updates, and gaming. Welcome, Welcome to, to the fun. fun. First updates now, supported by Stryker Careers. If you are a college student or recent graduate looking for an incredible internship, take a look at Stryker. Stryker provides a housing stipend, great pay, and an opportunity to work with state-of-the-art medical technology equipment. Discover why so many first alumni are coming to Stryker for their internship or career at careers.stryker.com. If you are planning on attending the World Championship, come meet others in the fun and FRC Discord community with our combined meetup on Friday, April 22nd at 11 a.m. local. Location will be announced closer to the event, and you can stay updated by following in either the fun or FRC Discord. Hey, and let's start out on the robot talking about your intake uh, area. Talk to me about, uh, you know, not just what it is, but like how did you come to this type of design and any changes you might have made as well too throughout the competition season? Yes, so this is an over the bumper vector intake. Um, it has a nine inch gap, so that's the diameter of a ball. So it'll just go right in um, to the throat. Um, it has mechanism wheels as well uh, for the extra stability when you were looking at uh, approaching the game challenge so you mentioned that this opening is only nine inches wide mm -hmm. and you know when i see your intake here it isn't quite as wide as we've seen from other teams out there yes. so when you're looking at it like how are you like hey this is what works best for us and because it has been working great for you yes it has been working great for us um we decided to go with the nine inches because it did fit the ball and through multiple testing and prototyping we were able to come up that this was the best design for our robot. Keeping it compact has worked uh, very well for our team and we hope to stick with it. So can we see a demo actually? Let's see the intake come down and I, I know I, I heard that you have a color sensor as well too so I think we're going to demonstrate the color color rejection as well right? So really cool on that. Uh, I like to see that the, that it actually comes out uh, this way on here. And when you're looking at the game itself uh, and the, the rejection model, was that something that was like a first thing you came up with? Like, hey, we have to reject uh, a certain type or was that added on later? That was added on later. Um, we decided that it was um, vital for us to get balls and be able to go anywhere and not worry about having the Alliance's balls in our throat. And so we added the color sensor after our first district competition, and it works really well. So, Well, thanks for talking to us about your intake there. Let's go next into your uh, feeder mechanism. Shlok's going to cover that. And uh, I want to hear about more of what's comprised of it. I see a couple different types of materials uh, going into it. So just talk to me about uh, how you came to what your feeder is. Yeah, so what we decided on is having essentially these two green rollers on the outside. Uh, they're just two-inch uh, regular, we call them squishy rollers sure. because that's what they do. And they just help grip the ball and kind of guide it through uh, this front area. We didn't want to do a big old hopper like we did in 2019 with yeah. our dead shot because we had a couple issues with that and it just wasn't as quick as having just the feeder essentially be right, in, right where the intake is. And so that's why we have these two rollers. They just add a good amount of compression without making it slow. Um, and they have their own motors so that they can actually help with the ball rejection system and not have to make the whole thing go backwards. And inside, we do have this bigger roller at the bottom because we wanted to make sure that we eliminate the dead zone there. Uh, wanna make, since this ball, the ball is a bit big, we want to make sure that we're able to pass it really easily and not have to worry about any dead zones. Yeah, I was going to ask about jamming if there was anything you tried to yeah. admit again. It sounds like that's, that was your solution, yes. right? Yes, and so. also we wanted to make the structure pretty simple, and so we decided to not have a bunch of rollers on this side, otherwise you would have to have a pulley system and gearing system yeah. to make the, go the same direction. So we just put Lexan, and it's been working great. We haven't had any issues with the ball slipping out or falling at all. Um, and on the back, we have some Versa rollers, uh, the black rollers there, and they've always been working. We worked for the past two years, we've been using them for gripping balls and putting them in the shooter area, so it's worked pretty well so far. Well, that's kind of a good segue to go into your shooter as yes. well, too. So uh, talk to me about, uh, first off, um, you have a hood but not a turret, but you do have the sword drive for that. Yes. Uh, so I'd love to just hear more. We, you know, we've seen teams do both. We've seen teams do one or the other. Uh, why was this the best solution for your team? We decided to just keep it simple. That was 
probably our main kind of mantra uh, throughout the season because you know we were coming off of a COVID season. Yeah. You don't want to start going and making super complex robots. So we thought that when you have a swerve drive, that's your turret. You don't need to make a separate turret subsystem up here. And so we decided to just keep a static hood, or sorry, a static shooter uh, with a hood that alternates between two main positions. And the RPM changes really between these two rollers are what give it that uh, flexibility to shoot from almost anywhere on the field. Before we talk about your climber, I want to bring in Karjik, talk more about your uh, vision system that you use on your robot. So talk to me about uh, not just what you have, but how you're actually implementing vision on your robot. Yeah, so we have a secondary co-processor called the Upboard, and it's located right here, in here. Um, so how we use it is, we on that, we do vision tracking and autonomous path planning. And our mechanism is, so instead of a $400 limelight, we can get away with this, and it works perfectly fine. So how we, we, do, we find the contours of the of the goal, so there's reflective lights on the rim of the um, goal, and then we find the middle of those contours, which are like boxes of those um, reflective lights, and then we find it, we find the angle from the center of our camera to the actual contour, and then we um, tell the so that's how it acts like a turret. So our swerve drive helps us um, um, line up to the goal perfectly, and then right when it's ready, we shoot it. Um, so the thing is. And um, instead of turning, uh, instead of the driver having to turn manually around, we have a system. Uh, we have a we have a thing that we know where always where the goal is. So no matter where we're on the field, we always we always know the angle to the goal. So if um, the driver is facing away from the goal, we can um, press a button and it quick turns straight to the goal like a turret. So essentially, um, it, we use trig, and it's called quick turn. Sure. So um, that's also pretty cool. And how we filter out like extra reflections and a lot of problems that we had initially was the reflections from the ceiling and a lot of stuff. So how we do that is like through a X and Y um, filtering. So we, we find the average contours where the Y value, it should be in between a certain band of Y values yeah. and the X values. So it helps us, so if there's like a reflected light on the top, we can easily filter that out and it helps us with um, an accurate tracking position. Yeah. Well, we've seen it proven quite well on the field so far, I would Great. say, yeah. uh, for sure. That I know we're going to be talking a little bit more about uh, autonomous in a little bit as well, too, yeah. so we'll get into that. Uh, first, let's hand it back to Lois. going to talk more about your climber uh, mechanism. Uh, so I'd love to hear uh, more about what's going on with that. And uh, if we can, like, demonstrate, like, your climber sequence or maybe talk a little bit about what's going on from your climber, that would be fantastic, too. Yeah, for sure. I think we can. Um, but this climber over here, it's we had an original design that did not work too well at our wake-up competition. Um, it just got hung up on a lot of things, and there was a lot of maintenance each time. Sure. So we thought to make it, you know, kind of take that off, completely take it off, and then go to just step one and, you know, plan and find the most simplest method that works. And so we thought that just having two arms, because one Andy Mark arm, or at least based on our Andy Mark arm, is enough to keep the robot up yep. and swinging. And so we thought, you know, let's just make it as simple as possible and only have two. One, and then you just essentially, we like to say, walk up the bar, like someone swinging on the playground. And so you have... Um, the one with only a single hook, um, or actually both of them have double hooks now, but you have one arm uh, pull on the first mid bar, and then the bot will naturally tilt due to the center of gravity, and then we have the bar set in an angle so that it tilts in a favorable, favorable way, and then we're able to clip onto the next high bar, and then we just repeat that motion for the traverse bar. So let, let's deploy it if you mind, can you just talk about each step as it goes through? Yes, uh, so if Michael is willing to demonstrate, um, whenever we see the first arm will go up, and that essentially, and so now we're going to be pulling down on the mid bar. And we have the second arm that comes up as well. And now that's coming up at the same time this is going down. And now we're going to be able to hook on to the high bar. Sure. And then it's an alternating motion. Now when that pulls up, we have this one go up, and it'll hook onto the traverse bar. So uh, it's essentially Are the like arms actually like moving at all? Uh, yes. Well, the bot would be swinging, sure. essentially. And uh, I can actually tug on the arms if you want. And so the arms will move a certain length out. Um, so that, and we've set these angles by just checking them and uh, restraining them with, you know, wire and also some uh, more elastic material. Yeah. So that it sticks to the bar and doesn't just fly around every time we do a spin move, but it also is able to extend to a certain uh, length so that we stay in frame perimeter. Well, that's really cool. It's cool to hear about the rebuild as well, too. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously it's been paying some good dividends for your team. Yes, so definitely. Uh, awesome to hear with that. Let's wrap up on your robot. Uh, Michael's going to talk uh, more about some autonomous and pathfinding and uh, other aspects that you want to wrap up your robot with. So talk to us about it. Right, so the programming is really where a lot of the work gets done. From day one of uh, the game reveal, we said we want to keep it mechanically simple and let the programming do a lot of the work. So that starts with the swerve drive and especially the odometry that goes into it. Um, Kartik talked about quick turn. Yeah. And that's something that we do whenever the driver doesn't know uh, exactly what orientation the robot's in. The odometry of the swerve drive is keeping it updated 
So he can click a button and the robot's already aimed close to the target where the vision can take over. You, using odometry, how do you compensate for like drift and that sort of thing? Right, so the way we worked around that is that every time we shot, we would use the vision on our, cam on our robot uh, through the camera that would essentially update the robot's odometry yeah. based off of where it is relative to the goal. That's really cool. And then I, I think we're going to show a little bit uh, about what's on screen with the, your Pathfinder as well. Right. So right here is the is our uh, web app that does the a lot of the autonomous work. We have a coprocessor on our robot that runs ROS. And what it does is it essentially runs these autonomous paths and it generates uh, sort of these, these points that the robot has to get to. It creates the instructions for when to drop the intake. Uh, when you should be shooting and such. Undarken that. Um, and all of that data gets communicated from the coprocessor through network tables to the robot Rio, where the Java end of the code can take advantage of it. So for example, we might have the camera, which is running off of ROS, determine we're a certain amount of units away from the goal. That amount of units will be communicated through network tables through the Java end where we can use the sort of trajectory calculations to figure out how to shoot. Well, 624 Kryptonite, it's uh, been great watching your team this year as it just seems like uh, something more just keeps improving each time. And I think that's a great thing about uh, first teams and a good track record as well, too. So wish you the best of luck here. Uh, also, big shout out uh, for Dean's List semifinalists. Wish you best of luck in that as well, too. So thanks a lot for taking the time and uh, good luck here at the competition. Hope to see you at Worlds as well, too. Thanks yeah, a lot. Thank you. Thanks to Stryker Careers for their support in this video. If you are a college student or recent graduate looking for an incredible internship, take a look at Stryker. Stryker provides a housing stipend, great pay, and an opportunity to work with state-of-the-art medical technology equipment. Discover why so many FIRST alumni are coming to Stryker for their internship or career at careers.stryker.com. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay up to date on our new videos. Keep the conversation going and provide your input to our content. Watch our live shows at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Join our Discord at discord.gg forward slash first updates now. And check out Fun FTC on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And First Updates Now on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter.